sustainability for the University of Oxford. And um, she is joining us today to present and discuss the biodiversity net gain aspects of the university's environmental strategy. Um, it's an opportunity for us to discuss uh, deeper issues about biodiversity and ask questions before the consultation closes on the 6th of December in a few days. Um, so over to you, Harriet. Thanks very much, Cecile. So yeah, I'm just going to quickly present to you um, where we've got to on the strategy for the university and how we've got there. Um, and then obviously very happy to take questions and have a discussion about what more we might do or uh, how we've got to where we've got to. So it was back in October 2019 when the Vice Chancellor shone a spotlight on sustainability in her, her oration, highlighting some of the incredible work that's gone on around the university already, but also asking whether or not we were doing enough and setting us with the challenge to come up with a more comprehensive and ambitious strategy over the coming year. So don't really need to talk to this audience about why we might need to do that. <laughs> Uh, but I put this slide in just to give one example of the many, many bits of research that point to the fact that we really need to be taking definitive, urgent action to deal with the climate and ecological crisis that we're currently experiencing. And this is just ex one example that you might be well aware of from Kate Raworth in Social Sciences, looking at how we've outgrown our planetary boundaries. And the fact that academic research concludes that we ought to be doing much more in this area is perhaps not surprising, but what is possibly more surprising is when the World Economic Forum highlights biodiversity loss and climate action failure in this top quadrant of most likely and most impactful global risks. So I think you can agree that it's timely that the university goes about agreeing and setting a more ambitious sustainability strategy. And so that's exactly what we set out to do following this process. We started off with a round table on sustainability that was chaired by the vice chancellor after her announcement. And we invited to that round table, many academics from across the university. We also had student representation and we had members of uh, senior management or pro vice chancellors with portfolios that we thought we would need to involve in the process. And then from that round table, which really set the direction for our discussions, we set up a working group of about 20 academics, PVCs and students, uh, chaired by David Prout, who's the pro vice chancellor for planning and resource allocation. And that working group's been meeting monthly and they've really been the kind of engine behind the progress of this work. And those monthly meetings have really kept uh, feeding into the work that we've been doing to develop the new strategy. But even before this process started, the university did have existing sustainability targets, particularly in biodiversity and carbon reduction. And I've just flagged those here. There are also some examples of good practice around the university and environmental work. So the standards that we apply to our new buildings are sector leading, um, particularly in the area of energy conservation. The work that we've done to reduce carbon across the estate has won awards. And just examples such as charging for parking in relation to salary and then ring fencing any funds that that produces to spend on sustainable travel. They're all really good examples of how we have attempted to do work on sustainability in the past, but still very much the case that that's not been a complete, a comprehensive approach. And it has been really difficult with our existing governance system to work out questions like, what's the university stance on taking flights? Or what's the university stance on investment in energy companies and particularly on fossil fuel companies? and what level of sustainability ought to, to be taught within a university curriculum. So all those kinds of questions 
would be very, very difficult to answer within our existing governance system, which was a steering group which fed into our buildings committee. So it was very focused on reducing the environmental impact of our very, uh, very specific close estate. So before the process started, we had some existing targets and there are also there are things that we know a lot about and things we know a lot less about, but we kind of know principles about them. So this chart just shows you more data about our carbon emissions. And it's fair to say that we're much more fluent in the impact that we're having via carbon than we are on the impact that we're having via biodiversity. But we have done some considerable work on that. So as a kind of background piece to this work would be we completed or we commissioned, I think in fact the person who did it is on the call, Izzy Taylor, we commissioned an environmental profit and loss piece of work so that we could show the kind of baseline environmental impact that the university was having in all the different key environmental areas. Uh, however, we already had quite a lot of information about our carbon impact and we described that in the scopes of carbon, scope one, two and three. So scope one and two being our the carbon that is as a result of our estate work, so from our buildings basically. And then scope three carbon being from the flights that we make and our supply chain, so the food that we eat, that kind of thing. So we know a lot about uh, emissions of carbon from gas consumption and electricity con consumption and flights. And to a certain extent, the resulting strategy is very focused on reducing carbon in those areas because we know so much about it. That's not to say that we don't agree that we should be reducing carbon in all of the other areas and that the same doesn't go for our biodiversity impact in all of the areas of operations of the university. It's just that we kind of we've got a bit of a head start on what we can do for scope one and two carbon emissions. And I hope that's that's what that slide is putting across that there's some stuff that we've got a lot of control over and we know more about. That doesn't mean it's easy. It's going to be really difficult for us to make the business case for um, moving university away from gas basically um, and and as you can imagine with old buildings that becomes quite a difficult thing to implement as well but just to say that that's something that we know more about um, so we went out to consultation about the strategy in March so we're on our second consultation now but this consultation was on behalf of the working group and the basic question, really, the feel for the whole consultation was, have we included everything in this strategy that you would expect to see in a strategy? Um, and we went into nine themes that I'll talk about in a bit more detail later on. Um, and we made some suggestions for some policies that we might make in those different themes. But this wasn't at the point, this is definitely not at the point where we're asking, should, would you agree with this policy? And, and now it's going to go forward. It's more of a kind of evidence gathering. So the overall response to that survey um, was incredibly positive. So the range of um, agreement with the policy proposals that we made was from 60% to 90% in agreement. And the majority of policies kind of had an 80 to 90% agreement, but the 60% one was a bit of an outlier and that was on parking and it's something that we always have problems with. Uh, but generally, the university community was very happy that we were doing more work on uh, a more ambitious strategy and that we had uh, covered more than we would have done previously. Uh, however, there was one negative bit of feedback, and that was at this point we were saying that we would achieve the goals of the strategy by 2050 at the latest. Now, for those that are aware of UK kind of uh, policy backgrounds, then that's a complete cop out because the, government, the UK government has already signed up to the UK becoming zero carbon by 2050 at the latest. Sorry, net zero carbon by 2050 at the latest. So we are absolutely obliged to do that anyway. So that uh, consultation was really helpful in evidencing that people wanted us to act more quickly. And so we spent the, re the summer kind of reframing the strategy. Uh, bearing in mind people's bits of feedback and making the timeline more ambitious. So we've now set the, the latest version of the strategy is on a timeline to 2035 with these dual targets of proving a net gain in biodiversity and net zero carbon. 
the net gain in biodiversity is um, quite a detailed part of the strategy. And also, as you, you'll be aware, um, achieving a net gain in biodiversity is nothing very exciting in terms of um, what we're legally obliged to do. So any new development that we have, we're already obliged to make uh, to, to evidence a net gain in biodiversity. But where we go much further is that in the strategy we're proposing that we'll get to uh, net gain in biodiversity also from our supply chain. So our kind of third level of influence where um, we're proposing that we, we make that into a net gain as well. So that's quite a big undertaking. So in order to really get the strategy going and to enable us to implement it, we've also identified these four key enablers that go alongside the strategy. One is about governance and really putting sustainability decisions at the heart of the university. And so I referred to this earlier when I said with our current governance arrangements, there are some things that we just can't really progress because the remit of the governance groups isn't wide enough to think about those kinds of issues. We're also committing the university to reporting on its biodiversity and carbon impacts on an annual basis. Now we already report our carbon emissions on an annual basis, but it's got quite a limited audience. So we're proposing that our carbon emissions and our biodiversity impacts go into our financial reports so that we get as wide an audience as possible. We'll also have to establish a Oxford, the Oxford Sustainability Fund so that the strategy is financed. Um, we've done calculations that show that the whole programme will cost £50 million more than what we would need to do anyway. So we've done a comparison to the, comparison to the programme compared to compliance with existing legislation. £50 million upfront investment. And actually the difference, we need a 50 million pound upfront investment. And if we use the income streams that we've identified, uh, then the difference becomes 30 million pounds, uh, which over a 15 year programme is a considerable amount of money, but probably not as much as we thought it would be initially. And also having a policy on offsetting. We are assuming that we'll have to do biodiversity offsetting fairly soon because there will be development spaces where we just don't have the footprint to be able to achieve a biodiversity net gain. However, with carbon offsetting, we're writing into the programme that we won't start doing that until 2030 because um, we want to really concentrate on bringing our carbon emissions down and we want to get to an agreed position within the university on what we think the best approach to offsetting is. So I said earlier on that there are nine focus areas and these are they, and they all have headline commitments. But if you go into the strategy, the draft strategy that's on our current consultation pages, you can see all of the different uh, policy proposals in each of these different areas. Um, and I suppose really the key point about the strategy is that we're really documenting the direction of travel for the university. And underneath of all of that, there will be policies and interventions that will need further discussion and further governance. And um, you know, there will be work for this for a committee to do throughout this 15 year program on finding exactly what the university community is comfortable with. We know that there's going to be some contentious areas. So we've never had a university position on flights before. And obviously times are very different this year. And so there have been a lot less flights being made. And some people will say that they have found ways that they can avoid flights that they wouldn't have found otherwise. But that's on the backdrop of a really, uh, in, uh, an impact that's really been increasing. Um, for, ever since we've been measuring it. So there has never been a reduction in the number of flights made by the university. It's increased year on year for the last decade. Uh, and so I think, I think what we're trying to do at the moment is gain support for that principle that we will have to reduce our flights. Uh, and parts of the way that we'll be doing that will be charging departments for flights. So putting a carbon tax on flights, but also just highlighting the flights that are being made so that there's more awareness of it. 
um, and possibly, you know, looking at what other policies may help us to reduce our flights. Um, looking at the biodiversity and carbon impact of our food and doing something about that, we know will be contentious because people don't like being told what to eat and they don't like, uh, you know, and change is, is often quite difficult. Um, so I think we'll have to have quite an involved discussion about that kind of thing. Um, Offsetting is contentious just because some people think that we shouldn't be doing it at all. But the working group has concluded that we can't get to zero carbon in the time frame that we've set ourselves. So the next best thing is to offset, um, but we should offset in a way that we feel is defensible. And then parking is just a bit of a local issue that causes a problem. And that's a real whiz through where we've got to and how we've got there with the strategy. And I'm really excited to hear your questions. I'm going to stop sharing. Thanks, Harriet. Um, I'll just open the floor to questions. Um, if you if you would rather uh, type your questions, please do so, and I can I can ask. Or if you want to ask, please do so. If you could put on your camera because we don't have that many people, it'd be nice to see everyone. Thank you. Hi, um, I have a question. I'm sorry for not my, having my camera. It's not a great moment for that, but um, <laughs> yeah, but thanks a lot, uh, Harriet. I, I, um, I was wondering, uh, I have many questions, but just to start with um, about how people might get involved in um, further shaping the strategy. So I see the, the committee that was formed. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. I might've missed something, but I, I didn't, and know if there was a time when it was an opportunity to sort of join that. Um, and also, I think um, in particular, my interests, um, I've been spending many, many years looking at supply chains um, and, you know, environmental and social impacts of supply chains. And I would say sort of the social dimensions of production and consumption. So, um, you know, it, it, it is, it I think it came up in the geography meeting that you know, there, there's not a lot of signs of, of sort of social science involvement in this process. And I'm just wondering if there's a role for that um, and how, um, how that might work, um, including firstly in the wording of the strategy itself. And then also in terms of the governance of the process, how, how can, um, well, I mean, social scientists or others, you know, get involved to, to help further shape it. Thanks. Thanks, Connie. So the best way of getting involved at the moment is putting the wordings that you'd like to see in the feedback to the survey. That's by far the best way of doing it. Um, in terms of further shaping, so what we've been doing is that we've been having these working group meetings and the way that we recruited for the working group was to go and ask divisional heads. So, um, so, and that was the way that we were directed to do it. So it's really difficult in Oxford because we've got so many amazing people that it's always really difficult to kind of recruit for things like this because lots of people want to be involved. So we've done as much as we possibly can to involve additional people to the working group as well. And it's a matter of us knowing about them. So I didn't know about you, Connie. That's brilliant information about you, the fact that you've been researching into supply chains. And so I would... I would come to you and ask you when we get to the supply chains bit if that was okay with you. Um, so we had kind of sub sub work group meetings on flights, uh, which we held in geography, and we had some biodiversity ones as well. And so we we do get additional people into the working group kind of workings uh, when we need to. Um, so there's that way. And then when the committee is set up, that question will go back to the divisions as well. So I think it's a point of flagging to your division that you're interested in being involved in that group. And then they will need to make the decision so that the whole of the division is, is uh, represented. And that point, and the point about there not being enough social balance in the strategy was made very well at the school, school meeting, as you, as you point out. Um, it was something that we did discuss quite early on as to whether or not we should do this from a whole you know whole comprehensive sustainability perspective and my that's my background I've, I've done corporate responsibility prior to coming to Oxford 
and really always tried to broaden that sustainability. But the view was that we've got such a lot to do on environmental that we didn't want to. Um, so it isn't. So we need to find the right words to describe this because it's not like we're saying we're going to do environmental and that's all that matters, <laughs> and we're going to do environmental and that will be at the um, that will be therefore harmful to humans. Uh, and actually, E.J. Milne who I don't think is on the call, on the call, is really good at describing the fact that we've got. A triple a triple uh, crises to think about at the moment and that being nature climate and humans and maybe we need to write that into the strategy and actually that really chimes with what the students are campaigning for at the moment as well so there is going to have to be some change in the wording of the draft strategy i hope that answers your question yeah sure that helps a lot and, and also feel free to contact me anytime yeah brilliant thank you sure Uh, I'm Jasper. I'm a research fellow in the School of Geography. Um, Hi, Jasper. I had a question about, I guess, the definition of biodiversity in the strategy um, and how that both relates to, well, I guess how it relates to cu culture um, and, and this kind of human and social side of things. Um, so on my reading of the word biodiversity and also our understanding of nature, that it's somewhat inseparable from the cultures that um, have co-evolved with biodiversity um, as an object, as in through interactions, but also as an idea, um, how that, why it matters to us. Um, so biodiversity is inseparable from cultures because culture is sustained by biodiversity. So people around the world are sustain sustained by the environment through uh, ecosystem services that they might be deriving, uh, cultural services, those kind of things, and, and long, standing relationships and values that they hold. Also, biodiversity is sustained by culture. So things like gardening uh, in the UK, traditional fire management and other places are uh, actively kind of shaping biodiversity. So um, there's a material concern around the definition of biodiversity. Um, and I'm wondering where does culture come into that definition? Um, and there's also an equity concern, which is, if we define biodiversity as being devoid of culture, um, who is then allowed to participate in those conversations about what biodiversity matters, what bits of offsetting needs to be done, how we should value like gain or loss of biodiversity? So it's quite a complicated question and I don't know how it gets kind of turned into a practical part of the strategy, but I was wondering if you could reflect on that. Thank you. Uh so I'm fine. Uh, you, you're dead right. It's a very complicated question. And so the, the only thing I can think of saying is what would you expect to see written in the strategy that would help? And then we can think about it. So, so I, think, um, I think it really reflects the last question as well and a lot of concern from the students. So yeah, I just, I'm just worried that I'll say something that means that I'm giving the wrong impression about what we've written. All I can really say is that we've listened to a lot of people about biodiversity and tried to come up with the, we've got to come up with the most accessible language we possibly can, because this strategy is not written for sustainability experts. What we're trying to get is a really broad base of support. And um, therefore, you know, we, we, did, we did do a little bit about uh, kind of climate justice and ecological justice and that kind of thing very very early on in the process and I think it got I, you know, I'm struggling to remember but I think it got edited out because it was very difficult it was quite impenetrable in terms of what it really meant but we've really acknowledged that that was the wrong thing to do and we need to keep on trying to find the right words but we're struggling so I'm kind of going at myself rather than at you and saying you know help us to find the words that you would feel were okay but bear in mind that we want this strategy the the usefulness of this strategy will be down to the accessibility of the language and if oxford comes out with a strategy that is, is completely impenetrable for the rest of the world then we are missing a massive trick of influence that we we should be able to achieve can I respond briefly with a yeah, suggestion? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so one idea, I guess, is to have a broader vision um, presented in the strategy that's not kind of tied to the specific kind of goals, 
that just sets out, lays out a slightly broader terrain of placing environmental sustainability within these questions of equity and justice um, that might nod towards the fact that we can't separate environmental sustainability from the broader sustainability issues. So it's yeah. recognized in the document, but not even if then it's not kind of in the initial goals, it leaves space open over the next kind of 20 years, which the document kind of, or 15 that it kind of looks towards for yeah. those things to kind of be built in over time. Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, I really like that suggestion. It's a good idea. Me too. I, I, I definitely, uh, yeah, third that. <laughs> I think that's a great idea. Yeah. Yeah, and it's a, it's an opportunity to bring in the the academic thinking and the what we have behind it. It's brilliant. Um, then Ian sent a question. Oh, Pam, go ahead. Go ahead, Pam. Hi, Harriet. Um, in terms of you know the biodiversity offsetting, I assume that you know you're using the DEFRA um, biodiversity net gain metric. But I think sort of following on from what uh, Jasper said. I mean, that's just about biodiversity, it doesn't acknowledge all the other elements that biodiversity contributes. And particularly within the context of, you know, COVID and generally we know that green space is important for people's mental health and people value having sort of green that they can look out on, you know, from their working places. I was just wondering whether in terms of having some sort of biodiversity sort of net gain, you're going to try and sort of take some of these other things into account, which are not really captured by the uh, DEFRA metric. Fantastic question. Thank you, Pam. So yes, we are using the DEFRA metric, but that's because we think it's the most practical metric around at the moment. Um, and we're using that on the very kind of straightforward bits of biodiversity net gain that we need to evidence. So when Oxford University developments, for example, so that's not the university, but the um, joint partnership that we have with legal in general, when they're building houses, they're required to achieve biodiversity net gain. And the specification will say that will be based on a DEFRA metric and they must increase it by 20%. However, just like you say, Pam, we're very, very keenly aware that improvements in biodiversity have, have lots of other benefits. And they quite often will, you know, there's, there's biodiversity improvements. So for example, and I'm going to completely steal an example from um, somebody that was on the call. Emily, Emily's piece of work. So Emily Warner's piece of work. So um, a butterfly bank, which, uh, you know, is not going to get you lots of points on a DEFRA uh, score, but it's going to be fantastic from an engagement perspective. It has got, you know, we, we're really interested in what kind of measurable um, benefits it's got for mental health, if, you know, and, and I think that kind of metric is going to become, start becoming a lot more evident. Um, then it's still definitely a valid thing to propose. So we couldn't, we can't just be tied into what will give us a, def, a good, a better DEFRA score. It's very much like we've been doing for years now on um, our buildings, you know, our new buildings and getting points for what we used to try to achieve, which was a BRIAM accreditation for our new buildings. Like getting the BRIAM points is not, you know, that doesn't, that's not, uh, that's not the driver. <laughs> <laughs> the driver is getting something that works for the university. So Emily did this brilliant piece of work when she looked over what kinds of um, interventions we could make across the university estate and what which ones would be best for biodiversity, but also talked to us about which would be best for a uh, well-being perspective as well. So it's definitely one that's been identified and brought into the thinking. So yeah, yes, I think in short uh, and and maybe we need to explain that in a bit more detail in the strategy. Um, I've got a question that kind of links to that a bit, I guess. Um, so last week when I did my talk on that biodiversity enhancement opportunities report, there was quite a lot of interest in 
sort of people wanted to know what was then actually going to happen on the estate as a result of that knowledge of what could be done. And I know that um, when I was doing my internship, we kind of discussed how this magnitude of the impacts on biodiversity were kind of greater than we could ever offset through the estate alone. And with the whole supply chains issue, kind of some of the um, offsetting of that probably wouldn't end up being, being done on the estate. So it's almost like seems to me like that's become a sort of separate opportunity that won't necessarily be set against a negative impact. So then it seems like it's more of a question of almost like voluntarily to what extent does the university want to do these biodiversity enhancement options that are a bit more kind of they'll have a range of difficult to quantify benefits not just on biodiversity like what sort of things do you think we might see the university doing in the future yeah so that's a bit of a big question which to which i don't know the answer <laughs> <laughs> and you know, your work, Emily, was part of gaining evidence about what things we might do and what things might work. And you know, we've, we've got tiny bits of, of experience where we've done some little bits of biodiversity improvements across the estate. So, um, you know, a swift tower in the parks or um, having uh, gardening patches across the estate. Uh, uh, that's not really particularly good for biodiversity, but it is good for people being exposed to uh, nature and learning about growing food. Um, so I think really that was part of the point of having your internship so that we had a bit more evidence about the kinds of things that we might do and really the world's our oyster but that's exactly why we need this fantastic committee that will help us make those decisions. So it'll be this process of um, bits of work like the work that you've done and the work that Izzy's done and the work that Oxpop do, has done um, all, all coming together with all these different kinds of suggestions and us bearing them in mind when it seems like a feasible place to do it because that's often a question that's really difficult to answer in biodiversity people will approach us and say so the swift tower is a fantastic example and we want to build a swift tower uh, and actually deciding on a location for a swift tower took an awful long time I can imagine somebody coming to us and saying, you know, we've got funding and the funding will only go on a green wall. Uh, where, where's your list of areas where you might want to put a green wall? Well, you know, we just don't have that kind of pipeline of projects for biodiversity yet. But one thing that we are definitely doing is um, we've done a big, a, quite a big deal of focus on Old Road Campus to work out what biodiversity interventions we might make there. So, um, we're in the process at the moment of getting kind of costs back for that and working out what we might do. Uh, but that will be things like um, wildflower meadow and um, I can't remember them off the top of my head. <laughs> wildflower meadows and then some interventions. Um, so things like letting, uh, reducing the amount of mowing that we do, but not, it, it can't be as straightforward as we'll, we'll stop mowing this area. It'll be, we'll increase the margins, we'll make the margins more uh, complex and diverse um yeah so those just, I'm struggling a little bit to remember but um I I think the point is that we need to work up what we think the best things to do are and then have a system for agreeing which ones we prioritize and that's exactly what we've done in carbon and we're really experienced doing it and doing that and for carbon it's never just just like you're saying Pam it's never just this is the thing that solves that saves the most carbon because it might be impossible to implement or very unpopular to implement, which nearly really means impossible in our setting, or it might be prohibitively expensive, or, you know, the, the list of reasons go on. So it will be that we're trying to achieve an improvement in biodiversity, but then it's what does it do to wellbeing? What does, you know, how does this compare with the Oxfordshire-wide um, conservation areas and, and, you know, what we should be focusing on from a scientific perspective? So I think there's there, there's always quite a combination of uh, factors to consider every time we take a biodiversity impact. That's uh, our intervention. Thanks. Um, I'll just I'll I have a question from Ian, and then I'll I'll let you ask Martin. Um, Ian's connection is a bit bad, so I'm asking for him. It's about behavioural change and the opportunity to influence behavioural change beyond. The, the university. So following on up on Jasper's question, is there an opportunity to engage staff, students and alumni of estate 
as well as on estate in their daily lives. Bearing in mind that the biodiversity challenge globally, nationally and locally is really struggling to get beyond the usual suspects. Yeah, absolutely. And um, thanks, Ian. I, I don't worry that people get bored with my answers. But anyway, so we've got a behaviour change programme called Green Impact, and it's aimed at all staff and all students within the university. And anybody can set up a team and go through a number of steps that would improve the sustainability aspect of your particular department, college, floor of a building, room in a building, whatever, whatever, you know, it, it's very, very flexible, but it's got lots of different criteria that you can fulfill evidence. We train students up to audit it, uh, and then we award people on how well they've done on Green Impact every year. We've had more than 100 teams go through imp Green Impact over the six or seven years that we've been running it and some teams absolutely love it and carry on running it every year some teams feel that um it's a bit too prescriptive and lots of people have never heard of it and uh, probably the majority the really hard to reach audience for that is academics so there's lots of administrative administrative staff that have got involved um and maybe it's not the right thing to be doing for behavior change for academics maybe we're just barking up the completely the wrong tree but within green impact it carried on going during lockdown and we came up with a load of criteria that were focused on what you could do in your house um, and, I, and i think there's definitely a role for the university for doing more of that and that's something that's come back from committee uh, conversations that we've had like can the university use its expertise to put together guidance for how people behave more sustainably so yes we can Will it be straightforward? No. Will it be quite a big process, quite resource hungry? Yes, it will. And yes, I think it's essential, uh, but it'll have to go alongside the strategy at the moment. We've got to get the strategy over the line in order to do all this great stuff. Martin, go ahead. Um, thank you. Thanks, Harriet. Um, so I'm, I'm also from a School of Geography and, and one of the projects we're in the very early phases of actually is looking at um, uh, synergies uh, between nature and, and cultural heritage. So, for example, um, whether letting plants grow on walls um, can actually offer some protection to the to the historic masonry and things like that. Um, so, I was wondering if that's something uh, that has been considered in the strategy already. That sort of scale, if if estates means um, things like white and woods, or if it can also mean uh, things like boundary walls. Um, and uh, whether it has or hasn't, um, how we could perhaps um, um, interact and uh, kind of, yeah, see if we can collaborate um, at this stage. Thanks, Martin. So uh, here's another way where my words get, you know, the better of me. So by estate, I mean our footprint for research and um, teaching and learning. So it really means the buildings in Oxford. It doesn't really mean white at all. Um, and we, I mean, the strategy definitely doesn't go down to that level of detail, but it just so happens that I'm also involved in the science area landscaping project. And uh, that project that is due to go, is due to start next year for a little while and then stop again and then start again once there's more funding available. But the point of that project is to get is partly to make more, better well it's a few things it's to get better uh, public space within the science area and to increase the amount of biodiversity in the science area and part of that would be through uh, plants growing up the walls in the science area um so yeah i mean absolutely it would be great to talk to you about, about that if that kind of sounds what, like what you mean i'm just struggling to make sure that that is what you mean <laughs> um and you know we've there are other places where people have uh, intermittently suggested we have more greenery but that could have planning issues so um so yeah but i think the science area is a really good place to start okay thanks yeah that is pretty much what i mean i mean i guess we're, we're looking more at um, whether we can leave plants which have already grown on walls there because current conservation policy is often to remove everything yeah. down to the last patch of moss 
Um, yeah. and, you know, we're looking at, at the gather evidence to show that there's good reasons for leaving that. And we would hope that one of those reasons could be biodiversity, um, in, in improving yeah. biodiversity or, or, or maintaining biodiversity in the, in the historic built environment. Um, but it does sound yeah. as, though, as though that's something that you're thinking about at one end of the scale. So yeah, we could, I'd, I'd really be interested to talk to you more about that. Yeah, just an extension of that is that's where exactly where we do, we have identified there being quite a big policy problem. So we feel like within planning at the moment, heritage always wins over sustainability. So if we're going to talk to the city council about doing some work on a particular building, then you know the her heritage comes before improvement of insulation, for example. And if the improvement of insulation is going to impact on the heritage, then we're not going to be able to do it. So it's a really interesting area. Thank you. Okay. Jasper. Um, I just had a question about the pathway um, image. First of all, sorry, this is really nitpicky, but I can't actually see it because the um, resolution is too low to read what's on the um, on in the boxes underneath. Um, and I just wanted to pick up on one of the things which I think I can make out on there, which is create biodiversity measures. Um, I was just wondering, could you talk us through kind of what what are biodiversity measures and what's the kind of um, idea for how they're going to be developed? I'd say it's very much what I really just said to Emily, I suppose, in that, you know, I'm going to find it <laughs> before I start commenting on it so that we're looking at the same thing. So are you reading it on the consultation pages and it's not it's not showing properly? Yeah, That's and right. when I zoom into 200 percent, it stays um, pixelated. Stays yeah, is that are you talking about the 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 teal box, um, Jasper? I see something that says on site biodiversity measures. OK, for the, is that for the first phase of outcomes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I've you know I've not really got much to add other than you know we we know that there are lots of things that we could do but we haven't got a plan for what we are going to do and when we decide what we're going to do we'll put it to committee and that's how we'll decide what to prioritize but at the moment like I say we're doing some work at Old Road Campus just so that we've done any kind of site-based biodiversity work there's been lots of little bits of biodiversity work but it tends to go with building development and it uh, hasn't been particularly well measured or controlled yeah um so yeah so will there be more opportunities to kind of input into that process it'll be via the committee so it depends who you're yeah i mean there should be via social sciences representative on that committee so yeah, further to to the the question around um, social sciences, um, it, for one thing, that's really helpful to know that there's sort of a line of command in terms of who's on the committee in our division. I guess is the person that we talk to, but but I think in also talking about the link between environment and society, there's a huge opportunity here for Oxford if you get the governance of this right to get people very excited and very involved. So that's another way in which social and environment are link linked. Meaning that um, I'm a little concerned that the very heavy focus on quantitative measures is can be very distracting in that sense, um, in terms of who feels that they can input into it, in terms of sense of ownership of you know, the Oxford community and beyond that. So I think that you know it's just something to really think about and, and I guess I can think about how if there's a way to fit into the survey um, that kind of reflection on governance I mean it, to be honest it, it was a bit challenging with I mean I've had a look at the survey questions and, and I find you know it's not hard it's not always easy to find a space to address the the my main concerns or my main ideas not just concerns. I don't want to put it in a say you know very, some of it is hopefully helpful and positive um, but it, I'm just it just isn't always clear where to put the comment. So I, I just, you know, especially from the in, in regards to the governance of this whole process, because you know, you get everyone on board, you, you know, you're just going to have so much more innovation, so much, so much more buy-in and everything else. And if we 
you know, keep the focus very narrowly on, you know, quantitative met metrics and, and sort of meeting, you know, government targets, for example, that could really constrain, um, constrain things more than is necessary. Although I do understand that that's a part of the picture, obviously, because, you know, that that's a, that's a mandate from, from the government, but, um, well, I mean, which, which of course it makes sense to pay attention to anyway. So that, that's just a, a plug. And is there a way in the survey to the best way to integrate a comment on governance that might be taken up? I'm just wondering about that. You know, yeah. yeah there's, a, there's an open text bit at the end of the survey. If you felt that you were running out of space from that open text bit, we've got a generic email address. that's just sustainability at admin.ox.ac.uk. And um, we would fold that into the report that we will be writing on the feedback from the survey. Um, I mean, I think the thing is to talk to the people in the working group that are from social sciences to see what they and see if they've got. It's a bit difficult for me to comment on concerns about governance because I'm quite guided by uh, existing university governance, I suppose. Um, so, yeah. I'd be, I'd be really interested in like a specific concern about governance. I think the focus on metrics, I think, um, how do I best deal with that? I think I, I really get your point, Connie, that it can be unhelpful and restrain creativity. And I'd really hope that we didn't do that. And maybe an example of us not doing that is, um, any kind of listing that we might do for existing research projects. So Oxpoc being a great example of that. So Oxpoc has done some amazing work with interns over the summer this year, really kind of coming up with practical um, kind of evidence about things that could be done that would help the sustainability profile of the university or would uh, aim at those, you know, help those two main goals. But also I think the themes with their commitments, they're, in the vast majority, they're not metrically based at all because the metrics don't exist yet. One of them, we had a lot of metrics in at the first stage of the consultation and that was food. And that was just because we'd done a whole lot of talking to academics about what we ought to be doing with food the summer before. And so um, we'd come up with proposals about reducing our meat and dairy consumption and, and we'd sort through the figures. Um, but I think we've taken that out of the strategy now because it was odd that there was one that had a lot of data in and, one, and none of the others do. So I think it's all very much open for debate and, um, and we have to set a governance system that works within the existing university governance system uh, so that we're not, you know, we're doing it in a kind of ingrained and embedded way as possible. So I think there's a real risk with sustainability that you can say, okay, well, we're gonna set up this whole different way of doing stuff. And then it just becomes people that are into sustainability talking to other people that are into sustainability and it doesn't become a really embedded issue. And that's what I've been really striving to do with this strategy. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, answers that, that helps a lot. Thanks a lot. <laughs> I have a, a question from Izzy Key uh, from the Nature Based Solutions Initiative. She's asking if uh, there, there would there be an emphasis on biodiversity offsetting actions also benefiting the local community in Oxford, so non-university. Um, she says the inequality in, in Oxford in terms of quality of green space, for example, is substantial. Similarly, for other sustainability actions, could there be collaboration with the city or county county council to help make Oxford more sustainable as a whole? Example, yeah, absolutely. More cycle we do that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't really know where to start, but yes. <laughs> I mean, we 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 liaise with the county on a very very regular basis. We find it extremely frustrating that we don't get more progress on transport specifically I like and definitely on more cycle tracks that's one of the key findings with the discussions that we've done about local transport and um county just ha aren't very well funded so where it's appropriate we we put funding into county council projects so I don't know what people think of that some people think that that's completely wrong and that we shouldn't be funding what the county council is set up to fund 
Uh, but we're of a view that if it's something that benefits the university and we can make it better by helping to fund than we do. Um, I could go into any number of different transport projects, where we are with it, how difficult it is, and all the ins and outs that have gone on for the past decade in that particular subject, but I won't, but you know, just, just so you know, <laughs> I think we're in there with all the transport stuff. In terms of making Oxford more sustainable, then absolutely, you know, we talk to the city council really regularly, uh, and it's often about what we can do for the whole city rather than just for Oxford. So it's a shame that that doesn't come across. Uh, I don't know how best we could put that across, but stuff like um, Oxford, Oxford Green Week, for example, we, we pay quite a big role in that. We, we've done things like put a film festival on that is open to everybody for free. You know, we try to make our things as inclusive as we can, um, when we can. So it's always down to this kind of feasibility, cost, practicalness. Um, yeah, I'm again, really happy to talk about a specific example of what, you know, whether we've thought of such a thing. One thing that we have been thinking about for biodiversity for quite a long time is whether or not we can try to really identify a green corridor going down the middle of Oxford. I don't know what people think about that. So it's not necessarily going to increase biodiversity, but it's going to bring it, make it look more valued. That's a good way of describing it. So really kind of identifying this kind of green corridor that's already existing through Oxford as a green corridor, call it something, you know, attractive so that it brings more people to it, gets people quicker access to nature, uh, really shows that Oxford uh, is supportive of biodiversity uh, interventions. Um, but as you can imagine, a project like that would take about 20 years, but yeah. Yeah, it would be brilliant though. Um, wait, Connie, I'll let you ask. I mean, you were about the group submission. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. yeah. So how how would we do that? Um, so let's say that a group has sent in some individual submissions. How would we send in a group submission, or should we just mail, just email a group? Comment yeah, just email oh. it. Yeah. I guess we, we, we okay. wouldn't have time to coordinate this for the biodiversity network before the 6th of December, but if we send it to you separately, would that work? Uh, sorry, sorry, say that again, Phil. I don't think I can uh, coordinate a group submission on the consultation from the biodiversity network before the 6th of December, but if we send it separately, would that, would that work? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, okay. Okay, so there's no particular disadvantage if we take a little bit longer then. Well, the thing is, we're trying to get, so we're trying to get any feedback all fed in before Christmas because we need to take this back up to committee by February, which means we need a final version by mid-Jan. So I'd say if we haven't got it by Christmas, then it's unlikely that we're going to be able to reflect it. And also that we're not going to reflect everything. You know, we're just going, we're going to have to take like like any consultation we'll have to take the major themes and then act on them but on on that note i i think you're not receiving many feed, much feedback from by on biodiversity specifically right so it would be good to encourage maybe individuals i guess to before the 6th of december to to provide feedback and push back on yeah, biodiversity absolutely. yeah um we're coming to a close, but I have one last question. Um, the about offsetting. There's always one on offsetting. Uh, so the the carbon, the carbon offset projects and the biodiversity offset projects. I guess and yeah. I guess you're not quite there for the biodiversity offset projects. But how have you been choosing the projects? And do you have a committee who look at um, them, look at options, or? So Cecilia, it's completely the other way around. So we're nowhere near okay. carbon offsetting and we won't carbon oh, okay. offset until 2030. However, biodiversity, so an example would be Court Place Gardens, which is um, a building project out in Rose Hill for graduate students accommodation. Using the DEFRA metric with all the uh, uh, kind of stuff that we know about the DEFRA metric, it's almost impossible to achieve biodiversity net gain on that footprint because that footprint is going to be more intensively used, which is a good use of that land, I think. Um, 
So we'll have to find some alternative space to offset that particular project. And the City Council, though this really links into Izzy's question, the City Council have already proposed a load of places where we could do biodiversity offsetting that's not on university land. So, um, and, and I don't know, I'm not up to speed with that project, so I don't know how far they've got with that and what they're now proposing to do. But um, although we haven't really worked out what our biodiversity pipeline of projects is, the City Council seems like they have. Um, so it might be that we have to do offsetting according to what the City Council wants initially, whilst we decide what we want to do for ourselves. Okay. Um, and then on carbon, um, such a lot to say on carbon, but really that uh, there's a very strong there's a very strong voice about doing um, geological carbon offsetting. There's a very, there's a strong uh, as strong a voice about not doing that. So it's going to be quite a hard policy area to navigate, and that's part of the reason that we've given ourselves quite a long time to work out what we do with that. But mostly, that it's the most sensible thing to do to cut down our carbon emissions from our estate rather than start offsetting. And there's, there are people that think we should be offsetting now. Um, but I think we've made the case that we, you know, if we don't concentrate on reducing carbon from our estate, then it's going to be really difficult to achieve. And we need to start that a lot. You know, we need to carry on doing that work more, um, give that more priority than offsetting. I just want to say I completely agree. I agree, with that. Jutvinda, <laughs> I know there are a lot that I would totally agree. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Alison, go ahead. No, I was just going to back up Harriet on, on that. You know, the main priority should be cutting our emissions um, absolutely as far as possible. Yeah, I'm, I'm quite sceptical about the geological offsetting. I know that some other people in the university are extremely passionate about it, but... <laughs> yeah, and we, that's exactly what we will do, but there'll be examples. Like my favourite examples is exam schools. That's a very heritage-protected building, as it should be, uh, but it's very much based on gas for heating it's got probably quite a lot of asbestos. And, um, you know, we're not going to get planning permission for air source heat pumps anytime soon on that building. So that might be one of the buildings that, it, although we can do amazing refurbs on other buildings, that might be one of the buildings where we just have to offset to start off with. And obviously the technology will change hugely over the next 15 years. And more people having net zero plans will help as well. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you all for being here and getting involved. And um, Harriet, thank you so much for taking the time to answer questions. Um, I think we'll, we'll wrap up and just again encourage everyone to contribute before the 6th of December to the, the sustainability strategy consultation. Yeah, and um, uh, the one last question from Ian alongside from uh, asking you tricky questions. What's the most useful thing we can do for you? Fill in the survey, ask other people to fill in the survey, particularly ask people that will never have heard of the survey to fill in the survey. Um, and, and, you know, and, I'm not even saying fill in the survey and support it, so fill in the survey so that we've gathered as much information about what the university community really thinks as possible. And we can't be tarred with, well, you've just asked the usual suspects and they're the people that have filled the survey in. Um, so, you know, we just, just help protect us from criticism would be really great. <laughs> But again, keep on testing us as well and keep on challenging us because that's exactly what we need in order to get a strategy that everyone can feel like they can get behind. Thanks. Thank you. And we, I guess we will probably have another meeting similar to this next term to continue the conversation. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye.